Have a seat, everybody. I love my wife. She helps me through a lot of uh, a lot of ways in life that, that you know can kind of tear us down. And she shared a psalm with me this morning. And, and we're trying to teach our our life group kids. We've got a, a group of young adults that meet at our house every Sunday night. That when the Holy Spirit is moving, you got to really watch for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Because signs come in our life, and things aren't by accident. Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you desires of your heart. Those words speak true to me. And I'm just, I'm just thinking maybe some other person in this room, maybe that's blessed you today. I thank you for being here today. Welcome to Westgate. Um, this is our little family here, and um, this is where it snows in September. <laughs> it's nuts. Michael was telling me, how many inches of snow are we supposed to get this winter? 200 inches of snow? What? My friend, I need a snowblower, and I need it now. If you're here with us for the very first time, I especially thank you for joining us today. And we have in the, uh, in the pew rack in front of you a white card. We call it our Get Connected card, and it's a way for you to be able to get connected. We'd love to know that you're here. There's a place on the bottom where there's a prayer request, and uh, we will pray for you during our family time. Our leadership will pray for you on Thursday nights, and we've got a prayer ministry that also meets, and, and they will pray for you. So you are well prayed for we are a church about prayer. We are a church where nobody is perfect, where everybody is welcome. And through God, through the gift of the Holy Spirit and his leading in our life, anything is possible. Amen? We're in week two of this message series, and we're calling it Works in Progress because we are, in fact, works in progress. Over the coming weeks, we're going to basically explore these various spiritual practices that help us grow as Christ followers. We're going to be talking about how we live life together. We're going to talk about what it means to worship God in an authentic way. I'm not just talking about singing praises to God, but having a lifestyle of worship when we're not here on Sunday. We're going to talk about giving, giving with a generous spirit and a joyful heart. We're going to talk about living in community together. Today, I want to talk to you about a really important subject about serving. Serving is vital to the life of a Christ follower. I'm going to date myself. I graduated in, uh, from high school in 1987. Anybody remember 1987? Yeah. There was a, a young lady and her story who actually took every newscast by storm. Her name was little Jessica McClure. Do you remember Jessica? She was 18 months old. She's in Midland, Texas at her aunt's house. She's in the backyard. She finds this little hole in the ground and she starts playing around in the backyard around this hole and actually falls down into the hole. The hole actually wasn't just a hole, it was a well. It was a well that went down 22 feet. She fell all the way down in a well the size of about like this, eight inches in diameter. 18, 18 month little girl. She's all by herself in the dark in this well. Every rescue worker around came to her rescue. There couldn't have been more people called to rescue this little girl. Hundreds of people came for one purpose, and that was to rescue little Jessica McClure. The problem was, this is a really difficult situation, very delicate. How are they going to save her? She actually fell into the well. One of her legs was stuck up in the air above her head. And she was in that well for days. 
In fact, 56 hours. And workers from all over the area came. There were policemen. There were people from the fire department. There were paramedics. There were doctors and nurses and even child psychologists and engineers and oil drillers. They worked tirelessly. And 56 hours later, Jessica, who's in the shaft for 56 hours, all by herself, freezing cold, all alone, hungry and scared and in the dark, these guys and gals did everything they could to bring her up out of there. They decided what they were going to do was they were going to dig and drill another shaft that went parallel with the well. And then they used what was called water cutting technology and they cut over 90 degrees. 56 hours later, they were able to bring Jessica up to safety. Hundreds of workers helped this little girl for one purpose, to save the 18 month little girl. Think about this. Think about hundreds of workers times 56 hours. That's thousands of work hours to do one thing. They had one goal. They had one purpose, to save one life. And my question to you is, how many workers does it take to save one soul? How many workers does it take to save a marriage who's in crisis? How many workers does it take to breathe life into a young person or a child and let them know how much Jesus loves them? The answer to that question is, it takes everybody. Amen. It takes all of us. Everyone here today, you and me, every single person to help a family that's, that's broken, to help a marriage that is falling apart and going the wrong way, to mentor young people who are the up-and-coming leaders, not only of our world, but for the future of our church. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was actually writing about this to this little church in this little town called Corinth. This place of Corinth, it was a place where people were just looking out for themselves. They were looking out for number one. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They were successful, ambitious people. And he wanted them to see who they were in light of Jesus and the cross of Christ and how he defeated death and he defeated sin. And on the third day, he was raised from the grave. He was calling them to a new way of life. He was calling them to a new identity. He was calling them to a higher purpose and to something that was bigger and better than they could ever have imagined to do on their own. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 15, and this is what Paul writes. He says, Now if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Then later on, Paul says this in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Paul is saying that there is something bigger and better that we could, more than we could possibly imagine that we could be a part of that we are called to be a part of, and that's to be a member of the church, to be a part of the family, of the body of Christ, in order to serve the kingdom of God and the people around us. He's, he's speaking now to a, a society of people there in Corinth who were so self-centered and egocentric and consumer-driven. Thank goodness we're not like that today. 
Think about that. 2,000 years later, the exact same problems they had then. All we do is we think about ourselves. All we do is we think about, oh, me, me, me. Paul's reminding the church of three things here in the passage here that we've been reading. He's saying, number one, all of you, every one of you has a gift. I want you to really personalize this for a moment. I want you to look at your own life. You have a gift. You have a spiritual gift. You are a part of the body of Christ. You. You have something to do. You have a mission. God has given you a function that is bigger than anything that you could ever do on your own. It's to do the work of the church, to bless people, and to be a part of the kingdom of God. We talked about spiritual gifts last week. Jen and I had a really good discussion on spiritual gifts. And, and I was thinking, you know what? I think our spiritual gifts are a lot more than the things that, that we are really good at doing. You know, it's more than that. Actually, I think the gifts that we have are the things that, that actually get us up in the morning. They're the things that excite us. They're the things that God has wired us to be like. And it's different for everybody. They give us a sense of purpose in the world. Our spiritual gift is so much more than just fulfilling some duty that we have to do every day, day in and day out. Where's the joy in that? God has given us a passion. He's wired you in terms of your sense of calling and where you are passionate. It's a very exciting thing. And then flip that. What, what is it that angers you? What is it that just chaps your hide when you think of people who are hurting, when you think of injustice, when you think of hopelessness, when you think of poverty? Are those things that just, oh... They don't just make you angry, they move you to action. God has placed within us something that will move us to a place of action. Paul's reminding the church, this is who you are. Jesus has called you to something more than yourself, something greater. Listen, you you sitting right there in front of me are called to change the world. Wow. Every person has a gift. The second thing that Paul's telling us here is every gift is important. Every gift is, is important. It has value. Paul says this in verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It's not for that reason to stop being part of the body. Skipping down to 18. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Our God is a God of order. He knows what he's doing. He brought you here for a reason. You have a purpose beyond yourself and you have a mission. I was thinking, what would it be like if our body parts could actually talk? What, what if we could actually have our body parts talk to one another? You know, I've got two lungs. What if they could talk to one another? You know, one lung says to the other, hey, what are you doing over there, right lung? Uh, not much left lung, just doing what I always do, providing oxygen for the body. I'm getting kind of tired of it, though. I feel like I'm, I'm just kind of taken for granted. I'm just, you know, just sitting in here. Nobody sees us. We're just locked in this little cage. And everybody just thinks that they, they can just complain whenever they don't have enough oxygen. This guy likes to go on runs. He likes to jog. He doesn't have enough oxygen, so they blame us. Look at the nose up there. He's all full of holes. The world stops if you get a pimple on the nose, right? But no, no, you know, if something goes wrong, we get taken for granted. You know what, left lung, what if we just take it easy? Let's just take a break. What would happen if my lungs decided to take a break? I'd be in big trouble. I'd be in big trouble. Thank goodness my lungs work the way they're supposed to work. When my body parts work the way they're supposed to work, that means my body is healthy. 
It means my body is productive. It means my body can be strong. The same thing happens in a healthy church. The exact same thing. We're a church that's thriving and growing because we have people who are working in their sweet spots, in their passion, in the way that they are wired by God and using the gifts that God has given them in order to serve other people. We are all given this kind of passion. It's what makes a church healthy and strong. So Paul says everybody has a gift. He says every gift is important. And thirdly, everyone has a calling. Everyone. Every one of you has a ministry. Think about this. People think that ministry is just done by people who get paid to do it, like the pastor who stands in front of you. Or, you know, the, the people who are church leaders. They're the ones that are supposed to be doing the ministry. I'm just going to hang back and I'm going to watch. I'm going to applaud them. Great job. No, it's not like that at all. You know what ministry is? Ministry is how you use your gifts, how you use your talents, how you use your calling that God has given you in order to make a difference in somebody else's life. And you serve them that way. That's what ministry is called. There's a reason why this is important. Because God has specifically gifted each one of you individually to be in a place and be in a space and be in a time where you can actually make a difference in somebody's life that I can't make a difference. I don't know the people that you know. I don't work where you work. I don't get to, to, to know all the different things that you know in your circle of friends where you can serve those people that I can't. You can love on those people that I can't. You can encourage those people that I can't. But God in his wisdom, he's put you in lives of people that I will never meet, see, or know. Do you think it's by accident? Nothing's by accident. The Holy Spirit has placed you in time and space here and now to change the world. And your world are the people around you. That's your world. Every one of you is important. All of you are necessary. And together we have this calling to join God in the work he's doing in redeeming and loving and reconciling the word to himself. You have a calling and a mission and a purpose beyond what you do normally day in and day out. And we get to be a part of his mission together. That's what I love so much about our church. I love how people lean into their passion. They lean into their giftedness in order to serve other people. So many of you are doing this. And I thank you so much for doing it. We had an amazing women's retreat yesterday. It was amazing because of all of the volunteers who put forth effort and worked in their sweet spot in order to make something an amazing experience for 60 ladies who came here from around town to worship God. People who pressed into their giftedness in food, who pressed into their giftedness with games, who pressed into their giftedness with leadership, who pressed into their giftedness with service and mercy and, and encouragement. It's healthy. It's the way we're designed to work together. An obvious place to start is to be able to start serving in church. I mean, it's just, it makes sense to me. I don't know if you realize how much it takes to actually do church on a weekend. Somebody has to show up really early to turn the lights on, move the lights around, make things work. Somebody has to show up early to start the coffee. Somebody shows up early to, to prepare the donuts, prepare the communion bread and the communion juice. We've got 
talented, gifted musicians who come early to practice and to make that experience something enjoyable for you. We've got a tech crew, second to none, who comes early to make everything just right from the temperature of the room to the volume of the drums. Everything that we do, we do for a reason and for a purpose, and it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of passion. And for those of you who do that, gosh, I haven't even started yet. We have like people who actually take time out of their day to come early to smile and greet people from the parking lot all the way into the worship center and let people know, hey, we are so glad that you're here. We'll show you where to go. Do you need help to find where the child check-in is or wherever they need to go? Then we have a whole crew of people, not just in this room, but in all these rooms over here who have these gifts of teaching and nurturing our kids to tell them how much God loves them and how much God just has a, a plan for their life because they too are a part of the body of Christ and they have a special place and a special mission and a special purpose. Creatively teaching kids the love of God and the stories of Jesus. We have people who actually volunteer. Get this. It blows my mind. They actually volunteer to help out fourth and fifth graders. I mean, it's nuts. But they do it. You know why? Because they're leaning into their passion and their giftedness. We have people who hold babies for an hour specifically because they love babies and they want the parents of those babies to be able to come in and enjoy an hour of worship to, together and just to spend that time. Those are some of the things we see. Imagine some of the things that we don't see. Imagine some of the areas that we don't see that aren't so visible, the behind the scenes stuff that are going on. I think of people like Kay Kempe. I think of people like him who devoted his whole life to serving people, not only our community here at Westgate, but as a volunteer firefighter, he loved on people and we, we, we honored him. He, he passed away a couple weeks ago and we're so sad to lose him, but we are so honored to have somebody like Kay Kempe in our midst because he blessed us. We couldn't stop talking about how much he blessed people with his experience and his expertise in bringing lights to this place like nobody else could. He brought physical light like nobody could. He also brought relational light like nobody could. Because of his propensity to serve and lean into his giftedness and his passion to serve people and to bless people and to be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's just one person using their gifts to serve the church. There are so many ways for us to be able to do this. Maybe you, you, you have a gift for building things. You're really good with a hammer and you're really good with a saw. We could use your help here. Maybe you just love to make things beautiful. You love green grass. You love to be able to, to make things just really pruned and cut and nice. You love to rake. God bless you. We could really use you. You know, all of that is done by volunteers here. These are guys who have passion for this and they lay into their giftedness, this gift of service. You could be a part of that. Maybe you have been gifted by being a morning person. And you have this beautiful smile and you have this welcoming warm heart where you just want to welcome people in and you could be a part of our first impressions team. It's a vital ministry here. Just letting people know that you love on them. A great way to start, start out and get involved in ministry. Men, get involved in our annual men's breakfast. I guarantee you will go away full. The food is second to none. Kelly leans into his passion in the kitchen and does an amazing job. Guys, we, we spend time in that meeting, not just talking about spiritual things, 
But guys, we talk about projects that we can do for the church and for the community. How can we be servants to other people? Ladies, you could be a part of the women's ministry. You could be a part of a ministry that just loves studying the word of God. Maybe you have the gift of teaching. Maybe you have the gift of mercy. Maybe you have a gift of leadership and we need you to be a part of that. Maybe you need to be a part of a life group. Maybe you need to lead a life group. Hey, if you don't want to lead a life group, maybe you have a home where you could lead a life group and host a life group. It would be an amazing thing. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a mission. We need leaders and helpers taking care of people who have grieved the loss of a loved one. This is a very specialized area in our grief share program. And it's vital to where people are, are at in their growth as Christ followers. Maybe you and your spouse have had an amazing journey, not a perfect journey in your marriage, but an amazing journey where God is so strong where you are weak and you want to share that kind of knowledge and share that kind of wisdom by being a mentor to another group, to another uh, couple that desperately needs mentors in their life. We need that here at Westgate. We need people who are gifted with the ability to work with numbers and to help with counting and bookkeeping and payroll and be a part of our finance department. We need people who are, are passionate about our youth, who are passionate about our little children and just have the gift of teaching and have the gift of knowledge to be able to just help them understand what, what joy is in the kingdom of God. We need people with the gift of helps to prepare our communion and to, to be ushers and, and to be able to, to spread the communion around to the rest of the people and, and to be able to pass out the offering baskets. Maybe you're passionate about the less fortunate. Maybe you're passionate about people who are lost in our own backyard here in Spokane. By all means, get involved in our benevolence team. Maybe you just have a heart to be able to share Jesus with people on the other side of the planet who don't know who he is. And you have this desire for cross-cultural missions. By all means, get involved in our missions department. So many ways to get involved. By the way, I just have to say, I have, Jennifer and I had the opportunity to be able to house some friends this weekend some missionaries from the Philippines that you don't know, and I would really like to bring them up and introduce them to you. Would you give a warm welcome to the Prop family? This is Mike and Jean. Hey boys, will you stand up for a moment as your parents are walking up? This is Luke over here and Mark. Are you guys gonna go for Matthew and John? No, you're all done, okay. Come on up here, come on up here for a moment. I'm gonna move this down here if you guys want to sit there oh you're going to take my seat that's fine that's totally fine that's totally fine no it's all right it's all good have a seat look at this i'm going to turn this on so then you guys can talk but i have a i just wanted to to, to bring them just as 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 a family who has devoted their life to ministry this is a family and i'm going to let you talk i'm going to try not to talk too much but these guys have really leaned into their passion and they found their sweet spot. So my first question to you, Mike and, and Jean, you know, how did you figure out that missionary work was your passion? I was 15 when I came to faith and an elder at the church in Southern California um, was from the Philippines. And I realized very quickly I was no longer wanting to be an engineer. I wanted to pursue full-time ministry. Yeah. And he told me, you're going to Bible school. You're going to need an internship. I have family doing ministry in the Philippines. I was 18 um, when I left for school, and I thought, a year in Asia, why not? And I went, and I saw so much need that um, a lot of people were giving out food and clothes. But um, I didn't see a lot of people working for the spiritual needs in the slums where um, I spent that year. And I realized I could do this. I could make a difference. And um, I like significance. I think we all do. And I felt like, yes, this is what I should do with my life. Awesome. 
Jean, you have anything to add? It's totally opposite for me. I, I grew up in a ministry family, and I wanted out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, after college, I realized that the Lord had really called me into ministry, and I had to obey to really have that peace that I really wanted in my heart. Oh, that's awesome. Hold that. I, I, it comes to my next question. What's it like to know that you are truly, in fact, leaning into your sweet spot, into your passion, this God-given ability that God has given you in order to, to be an encourager, to be a teacher, to be a preacher? Well, it, it's peaceful. That's, that's the thing that I, I, the word that comes to mind, because there's so much that's calling for your attention, calling for uh, people needing you. But if the Lord has, if you follow the passions that the Lord has put in your heart, you really have the sense of peace and the sense of um, joy that you just can't get anywhere else. I, um, I, it doesn't show, but I started back at a gym recently. And, um, and being older, I'm not so much trying to bulk up. Um, I, 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 I know... <laughs> He's done. Um, I, I know that I need to spend more time doing the aerobics and the bikes and the treadmills and that. And I joined a Zumba class with zero coordination. And, <laughs> um, and she laughs at me often. But I'm moving and my body feels good because we were designed to move and not just sit at a desk and type all day. And being active feels good. It might hurt, but it feels good. And I'm doing what I was designed to do. You've probably heard someone say... Find a way to get paid doing something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I was born for this. This is um, the, the passion. It's, it's like breathing. It's what I'm supposed to do. So, okay, so you're a missionary in the Philippines for years and years and years. What was that pivotal moment that you just knew, this is what I'm supposed to do? We've always dreamed big. We um, always want more. If we've got a church of 500, it's not big enough. We need a church of 1,000. And we felt like, um, the, the way I described it for years, um, success was on this plateau. And there was a 10-foot ledge to get from where we were to there. And I could only jump eight feet. <laughs> and, um, and people came along and gave us ideas and training. We went through something called Jonathan Training. And it just clicked. And after we took Jonathan training in 2012, um, a ministry that always had four or five churches going on, about 100 people. Um, since 2012, people we've trained, our team, we've started more than 300, or excuse me, more than 100 churches with more than 3,000 baptisms in the last seven years. Wow. And, um, and it feels good. <laughs> and it's, yeah. But it's, um, it's kind of like... You know, trying for that three-pointer your whole life, and then finally it just clicks. Mm. And, um, you know, it's like I said, it's what we're made to do. And some people, they are made to, I'm going to be an auto mechanic, and I love that. And, I mean, you were talking about um, people serving in their job. I have a hunch this church has full-time ministers at high schools. This church has full-time ministers in law offices or libraries or at Walmart, um, and they just don't realize it. Mm. And um, wherever you are, grow there, thrive there, and mm. take the gospel there. Yeah. Jean? Well, for me, um, when I was in high school, I attended a rally that had a theme, World Changers, Be a World Changer. And um, I thought this was this big, grand thing that you can do someday. And one day, we were already married, this little girl was brought to me. Um, they told me that her mom had abandoned her, and she um, would eat sand off of the really dirty beach. Um, that's where they cleaned her fish. They go to the bathroom in that beach. She would eat sand from this beach when she got hungry, and she was parasite infested. And she could barely stand up, and they brought her to me. And no one wanted to carry her because she was dirty. And when I picked that girl up to take her to the hospital, that's when it clicked. This is what being a world changer is all about. Mm -hmm. It's not this 
you know, you don't have to be famous, influential, you just have to do this act of kindness where, you know, yeah. where the Lord has put you. And that really changed the way I looked at things. Thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, I want to ask you, you didn't know I was going to ask you a question. <laughs> so what's it like watching your parents do what they do, working in their sweet spot? How does that inspire you? Everybody, this is Luke. Yeah, Luke, you want to use this? I'm just so inspired by them because cause seeing them work, I just want to do that when I grow up. I feel so inspired. You need to stop because you're going to make me cry. <laughs> that is awesome. You want to add anything? No? Okay. It's all good. Well, hey, before I have you, thank you so much. You know, it's, look at this. I mean, that's like, what else could you ask for? Um, it's a real blessing to be able to see you after years and years. And uh, they came to visit their, uh, you came to visit your dad. Yeah, in Olympia. In Olympia, and it was a, how long did it take you to drive here? Actually? With the snow <laughs> in yeah. September. Um, it took about seven hours to get. It took seven hours. We thought it was going to take five, and they were exhausted and hungry, but we got you here, and it was good. <laughs> yeah. So I tell you what, I want to pray with you guys and pray for you. And then um, I, just, I just want to thank you so much ahead of time. God, I thank you so much for this family. I thank you, God, that you have, have brought them to a place where they understand exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And they know their mission and they know their purpose. And Lord, I thank you for blessing them as a family. God, I pray that you would bless their marriage. I pray that you would bind Satan from their marriage in every way, shape, or form. Lord, that you would send your strongest angels to guide and protect them and their kids. Lord, I lift up these boys and just pray, God, I know that you already have. An amazing plan for their life. where they will change the world. Lord, we pray for your provision and your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good job, brother. Mm. All right, so here's the thing, you guys. I got to gather myself here a little bit. This is critical. Oh, thank you. That's critical. This is critical. If you have a passion to be a missionary across the world, do it. But if you don't, that's okay. What's critical is that you find the passion that God has given you. The way you do that is you get your hands dirty and serve. It can be anywhere. You might make the wrong choice. Oh no, will the world end? No, it's okay. Keep finding where your passion is. This is part of what it means to be a Christ follower, where nobody is perfect. And where anything can happen. You know, when, when the day comes where, where it's time for us to go home and we leave this, this place and we go up to heaven someday, you know, do you think Jesus is going to be all that concerned about how many degrees we have? Or how much money we've accumulated and saved up in the bank? Yay, way to go. Or even how many people go to your memorial service. He's not so much concerned about that. You know what he's concerned about? How did you use your giftedness? How did you use your talents to serve me? To serve my people? How did you use your life, the moments of your life in ministry? At the end of our life, when that day comes, what we all want to hear is for our Heavenly Father to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been blessed with a few things. Would you pray with me?
God, we as a church, we are humbled by people like the props. We are humbled by their impact. But God, we know that you have given us these kind of abilities to be able to change the world. Each one of us in this place. Not just the people that we see up on stage. Every single person, no matter how young or how old, to change the world. God, help us to be able to step out of our comfort zone and to get involved in some kind of ministry and serve people and find what our passion is. God, help us to lean into our passion so that we can be effective and we can make our body healthy, that we can make the body of Christ a working, productive, healthy body together. Send more workers, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says together, amen. Would you stand with me? And in these next few moments, as we, as we worship the Lord in this time, I want to invite you. I want to extend to you a time of invitation. Maybe for the first time in your life, you're kind of like, wow, I just want to have, I don't, I don't understand it, but I, I, I feel compelled to come forward and talk to the guy who won't stop talking. And I want to talk to him about how my life can be changed. I can't change your life, but Jesus Christ can. And if you don't have Jesus in your life, you need him. You desperately need him, my brother, my sister. Maybe you're like, I need prayer for what I can do to effectively serve. I know some of you have come to me and you're like, I'm not exactly sure what I can do. I mean, my body's falling apart. I don't know how I can serve. You know what? I don't know either. But I do know somebody who does know. And Jesus, if you ask him, he will help you. And I would be honored to pray with you about that. So in the, as the music's playing, let's have a time of worship, but let's also have a time of introspection as we look at our lives. How can I change the world? How can I make a difference? How can I serve for the betterment of somebody else in my life? Because you know what? What price will it take for you to be able to make a difference and take a step of faith and make a difference in somebody else's life? It could be your own child who looks at you and says, you know what, I want to be like you. That can be a scary thing and it can be a very powerful thing. Let's spend some time and let's worship. One.